What's going on dudes, Nick here or RGA and welcome back to another server owner stories. I know it's been a while since I've done one of these and it's because I've been so busy. Now this video is not going to be about why I've been so busy. I know you guys hear that a lot from me, but this video is actually going to talk about something different. Now it does cover some of the stuff that keeps me busy, so I guess kind of goes hand in hand with that, but that's not really the focus of this video. Today's focus is going to be the technical side of running a large Minecraft network. In a previous one of these videos, I kind of went over some of the basics of running a server. It was not really exactly how to run a server. It was things that you need to think of before you think, hey, I'm just going to go run my own server. And a lot of it focused kind of around like the costs and other restrictive things about running a server. Now, I'm not really going to go into any super specific details either. So if you're here for that, then unfortunately, you're in the wrong place. This is not going to be one of those videos. Today's video is more of kind of an overview of the progression of the server and you know how it started off versus where it's at today. But without getting into too much of the nerd stuff. Now, when I first started off running Minecraft servers, I did it on a server that I was renting. It was a virtual private server, and it was mainly just used for me and my friends. There was two servers that I ran on it, and they were both super tiny servers. I mean, at, at most, there would be... I don't know, three or four people on the server. And that was pretty much it. Over time, I kind of outgrew that VPS. If you guys don't know what VPS is, you can Google it. It's basically a server in a server. It's running virtually, so it's not even like an actual on the hardware sort of thing. It's it's different than today's virtualization. Back then, it was, it was way worse. So essentially what happened is I kind of hit a cap where that server just wasn't able to keep up with what I needed it for anymore. And it, it was quickly outgrown. So I was like, okay, well, what are some of the options that we could do? You know, that, that's when I started looking at some of the hosting providers out there to see what they were offering. And that's kind of when I stumbled across Bungie Cord. But see, back in the day when I first started running servers, I ran them individually. You had to connect to them on different ports because that's just how I thought it had to work. But when I got to some of the bigger server providers, they started talking about something called Bungie Cord, which is basically a way that you can put multiple servers behind one front end interface. When I first saw it, I was like, oh, what the heck is this? You can have 500 players on your server for like 10 bucks a month or something. And I was like, wow, that's awesome. But then I realized Bungie was not actually a Minecraft server with 500 players. It was essentially a proxy server that would allow people to connect to the front of it and be distributed amongst different backend servers. And that's kind of what started me down the path of creating an actual network. No longer was I constrained to having, you know, one server per port. Instead, I could have multiple servers all coming in through that same port. So if you want to go from server A to server B, you could type a command that would send you between the two rather than having to disconnect back to your servers list and select the other one that you wanted to play on. Now, from a server's playability, standpoint I mean that is huge that is the essential gameplay mechanics behind what drives a lot of the largest networks the problem with this method however is most service providers and I'm gonna say most because I haven't obviously tried them all but pretty much every service provider that I worked with definitely oversold their hardware and if you don't know what that means, it basically means they put way too many servers on too small of a box. See, you would pay for a certain amount of space on a box. Like you'd buy a package that says like, buy this server package for $20 a month. You can have up to 20 players on this thing and we'll give you this many gigabytes of RAM. And you know, they have like all these little restrictions. You're like, okay, that's perfect. And then all of a sudden you start realizing that your server is lagging really bad, even though you're not really doing all that much with it. And the biggest problem is it's because not only are you running your servers on there, but you might have hundreds of other people also running their servers on that exact same box. Now, while your server itself might not be doing anything too intensive, someone else's server on that box might have a bad plugin that is just destroying the CPU or hammering the disk so that you can't even read or write to it efficiently and it starts making your servers run like crap. And that was the, one of the biggest problems that we started running into was that all these hosting providers out there oversold their hardware and at a certain point your boxes would just lag no matter what you did. You could have the best configs and stuff in the world, but if the boxes just don't have the available CPU or disk, then it's just going to destroy your ability to run servers. And that's kind of what started happening to me after a while. Up front, you don't really notice it much because when you've only got a couple people on the server, there's really not that many people that would even notice stuff like lag. But once you start getting up, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 plus players on a server, 
you really start to notice a lot of the stuff that goes wrong with the server. You start noticing things like lag because this becomes more apparent because you're putting more strain on the box and then you're actually, you know, increasing what was probably oversold in the first place. And then that's kind of when it started leading down the route of getting our own hardware. So at that point, we looked around, you know, there's just, we contacted multiple providers. We've tried different servers, different hosting companies, and they were all the same. It would just start to lag really bad and you know occasionally they'd move you to a brand new box that has nothing running on it but then after a while that one would become oversold and it just it didn't freaking work so we had to go to our own server hardware now there's a lot of companies out there that do different types of software providing or server hosting uh, but it's again it's one of those things you really need to do your research on because most of the solutions out there are very very expensive if it's not expensive to rent the boxes then there's other fees that are super expensive on on top of that. There are a bunch of companies out there that are really, really well known, such as Amazon Web Services, Google, Microsoft, and they all have their own server hosting environments. But the key thing to take away from those is, while their servers might not be all that expensive, you'll probably end up spending as much or more than your hosting costs on bandwidth. And that's kind of the ultimate killer to a lot of the different service providers out there. I mean, we've checked multiple ones and they were all, they all looked good on paper, but then when you actually start looking at some of the implementations and bandwidth usage, then that's kind of really what kills you. So this really, really leaves you with a much smaller list of server providers that you can go to because of the fact that it is so expensive to do that. And there are other options as well, such as running your own servers in your own data center, but then you're having to fork out a lot of that cost up front to buy the servers, plus then you're gonna be locked into multi-year leases at a co-location. And no matter what way you look at it, it's pretty much going to be expensive. There's really no easy way to get around that. But again, this is not about how expensive it is to run a network. This is more about the technology. And this is, so this is server technology. This is you know what runs your Minecraft servers. Obviously, there's a lot of factors that go into it. How much RAM you need, how much bandwidth you need, what kind of CPUs you need, what kind of disks you need. And once you determine all that stuff, you can get your base network set up. One very important thing that you have to remember is that as you grow and always expect to grow, don't build a business thinking like, oh, well, we're never gonna grow. You have to kind of think of when we grow, how are we going to maintain this? If you're running two or three servers behind a single bungee, you know, it's not really that big of a deal if you have to do updates because you can usually just run everything all in one box and you can push your patches out through the file system. And you know, that's pretty much all you have to do. But as you grow, if you start getting a dozen servers, and that means that's a dozen different boxes you have to log into every time you want to push out a patch. And if you've got different user accounts on multiple boxes, then you have to prepare for that stuff. You have to worry about different firewall rules. As soon as you get multiple boxes, then all of a sudden like your boxes need to talk to each other and your boxes need to partially talk to the outside world but you also don't want your boxes being talked to by other services that aren't you and you really have to lock things down so there's a whole security side of stuff or else you're going to end up getting backdoored which then leads to a whole bunch of other problems and that's kind of the part that we kind of got to one day where we were in a facility and it's a very big facility, but unfortunately we noticed that there were just lots and lots of computers trying to constantly gain access to our network infrastructure. And it's something that's technically against their terms of service, but it's going to happen. People will get hacked. People will try to hack into stuff. That's just the world in general. That's why you keep hearing all these companies on TV constantly. Oh, this company had their credit card database exposed. Oh, this one had its customer access portal exposed because people sit there and you know, not even people I mean programs and bots sit there and try to like hack their way into systems all day long in hopes that they can actually get access to some of your data now some of it's malicious and some of it is you know trying to get profit let's steal it and try to sell it back to you but again this is in the security video this is just kind of like some of the stuff you have to think about as you're building out your network infrastructure now, without getting into too much detail here, because I don't want to bore you guys, it kind of leaves you only with one solution. You need to go with more of a private networking solution. You don't want any of your backend stuff exposed to the internet because the internet really is a bad place. A lot of bad things can happen there. But that super, super complicates the entire process. I mean, you're talking about a lot of work because you're going to have to probably have some kind of a domain service. You're going to have to have your own firewalls and routes. And there's just a lot of stuff that goes into that and stuff that you have to think about unless you want to get hacked and you don't care if your customer's data gets exposed. But again, this is, this is, I'm see, I'm turning this into like a privacy protection video. 
And while I could talk for hours on that, that's not really what I wanted to get across here. Now, let's just assume for a second, you've got your network done, you've got everything secured, you've got your servers set up properly, and you've got some kind of panel to manage your servers. Now, think about what happens if all of a sudden you have 100 plus servers running all on your network. That's essentially the part that we got to at Performium is we've got over 100 servers running, well over 100. And it becomes a major task to start monitoring all that stuff, make sure everything stays up and get it to talk to everything. And there's just, there's a lot of stuff that goes into that aspect. So, you know, growing the network is one thing, but super expanding into other areas is a whole different topic. I mean, let's just take a small scenario. Let's look at something like our newest addition to the server, which is Skywars. We added a, a Skywars game. And the thing about mini games is if you can't just play them, then no one's gonna wanna stick around and wait, which means you now have to have Skywars servers ready 24 seven. So I know what you, a lot of you are thinking like, oh, well, I'll just run like two or three of them or four or five, or maybe just go with 10 so that there's always some ready. Okay, fine. You know, obviously you've probably thought of a way to make sure that players always go into one box that's ready versus another one that's already started. Um, so let's not even get, let's just ignore that and pretend you have something in place that can manage that. Well, now you've got 10 servers sitting there waiting to accept Skywars players. And all of a sudden you're like, hey, you know what? I want a Hunger Games game. And the same rules apply there. So you're like, oh, okay, well, let's take 10 servers and set them up as Hunger Games servers and apply your same logic that kind of splits the players into the proper servers. Well, now you've got 20 servers. And at any given time, you might only have like two or three of each in use. And maybe something happens where all of a sudden Hunger Games becomes really popular and everyone wants to play it. So you're like, okay, I'm going to take some of the Skywars servers, shut them off and make them into Hunger Games servers. So now you've got 15 Hunger Games servers and five Skywars servers. And then all of a sudden, you know, people are like, okay, okay, we've had enough of Hunger Games. Let's let's go on to Sky Wars now. And all of a sudden, now you've only got, you've only got three Hunger Games servers in use. So you're like, okay, crap. Well, let me go shut off 10 Hunger Games servers, and we're going to put the, those 10 as Sky Wars servers. So you're sitting there managing all the balance of these servers. And a lot of times you could have a bunch of empty servers sit in there. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, let's add, let's add this game and that game and that game. And now you're, you've got all these things that you have to manage on a per server basis. And this whole thing is just an extremely painful process. And you really have to think about some of these things up front. Like how are you going to make this stuff work? You can't just have servers sitting there because if they're empty, then it's just a waste of server resources. You could be running something that's more popular. So now you need to find a way to get all these servers to kind of talk to each other and be like, oh, well, we need more this server. Let's start up as that server or that server. And that's something that we had to do in Performium was make it so that we don't have a bunch of servers sitting around idle just within our environment. We wanted to make sure that every game's always ready, but we also didn't want to have a bunch of stuff sitting around idle. And I can tell you that for most people, that's probably something that a lot of them would be like, oh, you can't really do that. There's no way to make that happen. And I can assure you that there is a way to make it happen. I mean, that's how most of the big mini game networks run. Everybody does it differently. There's a million ways to implement the exact same thing. But again, this isn't like a tech talk about how to do that stuff. This is just kind of an overview of things to think about. So beyond just like the physical server requirements, there's so much more that you have to think about. You have to think about what hardware do you need? What kind of security do you need? What kind of network do you need? What kind of software do you need within your network? Like, how are you going to run your network? How are you going to expand? And if you don't set yourself up properly, then you're going to get to a spot where you just can't manage it anymore. You've got too many things going on. You can't maintain everything. Things are getting out of date. Things are crashing, breaking, and it just turns into a management nightmare. And that is just, you know, a small part of what we deal with on a daily basis. And kind of the purpose behind me sharing this was showing you some of the complexity behind some of this stuff. Now you can sit there and you can try to imagine a million different ways to make this stuff work. But I can assure you that a lot of this stuff is, it's very complicated. There's ways to make it not complicated and that's what I've done. But you know, for most people, I feel like a lot of people would struggle trying to comprehend, well, how could you even have a server that could be this game or that game or that game or that game or that game and it does it on the fly. That doesn't even make sense. So from a technology standpoint, there's just so much you have to think about. 
there's like I said there's a million pieces involved with everything and there's so many different ways to do it but it's one of those things that if you're going to do things properly you have to plan this stuff out up front and you want to make it as simple as possible because if something goes wrong you don't want to have your servers down while you're trying to fix something for a couple days because all of a sudden this server went offline or got out of sync with this thing and you know backups that's a whole different solution I'm not even going to try to touch that in this video but there's so much technology that goes into this and pretty much a lot of that technology I would say most of the technology that we use has been custom developed by myself and Mac and that's just because we had to do things that are pretty much new there's not a lot of companies out there that do what we do and technology wise we're definitely ahead of most of the people that we've known and I'm not trying to brag about like oh wow look how special we are because we're doing something that no one else is doing I'm saying that because like there's more to it than just simply running a Minecraft server and that's something that a lot a lot of people really see they just think like oh you've run a Minecraft server that's so simple Wow, how hard could that be? But there is a lot of stuff that we do that is directly related to that stuff that you guys will never see. So I hope this little peek back into some of the technology behind the scenes helped you guys learn a little bit more about what we deal with on a daily basis. I mean, it's, it's a very, very quick peek. And if you want to learn more about some of this stuff, leave a comment below with exactly what you'd want me to expand on. Maybe I could expand on some of that stuff a little bit more. Or if you have other ideas for server owner stories, let me know and maybe I will do that in the next video. But thank you guys so much for watching. Sorry I haven't been very active. I'm literally working out of a closet. If you want to see the picture, it should be on my community tab somewhere. But yeah, it's, it's just been rough. The next few months are going to be very rough like this and eventually I will make a comeback on here, but it's going to take some time. Anyways, thank you guys for sticking with me. I will talk to you next time. Goodbye.